Welcome to Dialogue Weekend. I'm Xu Qinduo. Chinese social media late up this week after news came of a famous entertainer accused of abandoning her surrogate children. What is surrogacy and how does it work and why is it illegal in China? To discuss these issues and more, I'm joined by Anna Tengen, an independent current affairs commentator, and Professor Li Jin Zhao from Beijing Foreign Studies University. So welcome to the show, Professor Li and Anna here. Uh, so, Anna, I will start with you. you know, what is a surrogacy and you know, why it is uh, uh, controversial now? Well, it's a broad term and it covers uh, a lot of procedures. Basically, it's, there's about 8 to 12 percent of the population, uh, world population, that are infertile. Uh, one or the other or both uh, cannot conceive children. So surrogacy was a way for them to do it. They could uh, find uh, somebody to donate eggs or sperm or whatever was necessary and get it done. But you know, lately, it's become uh, not about medical necessity or you know a danger to the uh, to the mother, but it's been about fashion. Uh, women who do not want to you know destroy their figure uh, because you know carrying a, a child mm -hmm. will will make ch cause changes to your body, and they simply want to have children the easy way. You know, select a father or have a have an already made father, and then have somebody else carry it to term. And there are real moral and ethical issues as well as economic ones involved. Mm -hmm. Well, Professor Lee, uh, from mm -hmm. your point of view, mm -hmm. you know, as uh, mm -hmm. this this is about obviously motherhood, right? Surrogacy, uh, motherhood uh, yes. there, and you have a medical purpose mm -hmm. for those who are unable uh, to carry, or uh, you mm -hmm. know, because of health reasons, you can't have a, a baby. You want to have a baby, mm -hmm. then surrogacy provides a choice. But the other, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it goes beyond that right now, just as Anna Tanke mentioned about, it's more like a commercial surrogacy uh, for people who yes. refuse to go through those pregnancy periods. They say, hey, you know what? I have another choice as long mm -hmm. as I pay. Uh, so are you for it or are you against it? Um, I think we should be really cautious against uh, this cosmetic uh, way uh, of seeking uh, offsprings uh, through surrogacy, but uh, aside from the the fashion reasons, uh, I also see that uh, you know uh, among a section of Chinese population, there is still this boy preference. So some uh, well-to-do families and some affluent businessmen, um, after a one-child policy, they still want to have more boys. Uh, and their wife probably are already passed uh, the the prime age of giving birth or getting pregnant. So they also seek surrogacy. And also um, uh, gay community, uh, a lot of uh, gay couples, uh, either willingly or unwillingly, are still seeking offsprings. So they are also seeking surrogacy. So, um, but I think um, surrogacy should not be totally banned for those couples who suffer infertility, infertility, and also for those uh, couples who have lost the, their only child, especially the couples who are now in their 50s and they have lost uh, their single child. Uh, and uh, statistically, uh, this, this, uh, this proportion of uh, single, I mean, childless family of parents in their 50s will be about um, uh, 10 million. So that's an exorbitant amount of number. So we should be really um, concerned about their rights of having offsprings, having children. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that commercial surrogacy should be fully open and should be widely available for all different populations' needs. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, you, you think there's a, a potential uh, issue with a commercial uh, surrogacy there. And, uh, you know, one, yeah. of course, why we are talking about this because of, as we mentioned, uh, you know, a Chinese entertainer, you know, because of a personal reason, and then she refused to uh, receive, accept this surrogacy children over there. So this is a big, big uh, controversial issue over there. And of course, then mm. there's a risk about the, the, the baby, you know, uh, who will take care of them and mm. where they will end up there. Uh, so it's how big a problem is that, you know, somehow people are, I'm not sure they are abusing the system, but there are obviously, you know, for commercial mm. uh, service, uh, there's a problem, a potential issues, probably bigger than people realize sometimes. 
Well, surrogacy or commercial surrogacy has been a very sensitive topic in China since the um, 1990s. Um, the, the first uh, family who successfully got a surrogate child was in 1996. So since then, it became a very sensitive and uh, contentious topic. But um, the central government uh, has not been really uh, has is assertive in making surrogacy or any form of commercial surrogacy illegal, but uh, the law has been not really seriously carried out. So there has been this gray industry, very lucrative, uh, very prevailing uh, surrogacy industry in China. Um, so I think um, now this entertainer's individual case is has its more symbolic uh, bad influence uh, rather than the de facto bad uh, aspect. Actually, uh, I think the both the central government and the local government should uh, really begin to think about uh, how to deal with this vast, uh, gray industry mm -hmm. um, that has that has been going on for like twenty years. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Anna, here, mm -hmm. you know, uh, surrogacy, obviously, in some countries, it's illegal. Some countries, it's illegal. Uh, even in the United States, probably in the more advanced stage, the legal uh, regulations are basically patchy. Some states are OK. Some say no. But in China, it's illegal. Uh, you know, what's your take on why China is taking such a stance here? Well, uh, China uh, likes uh, bright line rules, and they just saw that this was a, an area that was fraught with a lot of problems. They haven't, uh, as the, my colleague has said, they have not cracked down on it. Uh, the, but the big, big danger here is that uh, you, people will go abroad, and they will have them. I mean, in the United States, uh, you can go to Texas, you can go to New York, you can go to California. Uh, there are a host of other states where it is absolutely legal, and they have um, uh, contracts and, and, and case law about it. But um, you know, it becomes very much an economic thing. It costs between ninety and one hundred and thirty thousand just for the surrogate mother. That does not include IVF, mm -hmm. which is the in vitro fertilization, which costs fifteen thousand dollars a try. Okay. It can take as many as three or four tries before you're actually uh, successful. So, you know, the wealthy, unfortunately, will probably be able to continue uh, having it because they can simply register the child as born overseas. Mm -hmm. uh, and you won't be able to tell because, uh, you know, the genetics will match no. and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. But so it's a, it's a very difficult, but it's a very good example of how technology is creating new areas of, you know, uh, Problem. problems. And well, that's the truth. I mean, uh, every solution just creates a new set of problems. Mm -hmm. And in this particular case, it involves legal, ethical, and uh, moral issues, and also money. Right. Yeah. Uh, Professor Lee, you are nodding ahead. Mm -hmm. Then, you mm -hmm. know, if you go beyond yeah. this medical purpose, you know, for those who need mm -hmm. such a service, who need such a assisted reproductive technology to solve their own challenge, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you look at this commercial uh, practice of a surrogacy there, uh, simply because, you know, I don't want to go through this pregnancy, you know. Usually it's between the surrogate mm. mothers and those, uh, you know, who can afford. So it's between poor mm. and the rich. Do you see that as a problem? Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind yeah, of like indeed, exploit, indeed. exploitation somehow. Yeah, the actually, uh, uh, the exploitation of women uh, or in the instrumentation, uh, instrumentalization of women's uh, wombs, and also uh, the instrumentalization of babies are the two top concerns uh, why uh, China has made surrogacy totally illegal. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, uh, according to existing studies, uh, uh, including the parents who went to the United States for surrogacy, only a very small number of, for instance, celebrity women uh, are seeking surrogacy because uh, of their career concerns or their other concerns. The uh, dominant majority of parents seeking surrogacy abroad are those who do have medical problems. So uh, I think the medical concern is the primary drive for parents seeking commercial surrogacy. 
Uh, but uh, I agree uh, with my colleague that there is definitely this cultural lag uh, because the technology has allowed uh, the um, reproduction to uh, go in a very advanced and uh, mechanized way. But the mores and the folkways in China are still family oriented, I mean, uh, extended and biological family oriented and child centered. That's why a lot of uh, couples are desperate when they find out that uh, they have lost a single child or when they are infertile. Um, that's why uh, in, in, the chi in China we have this old saying, Bu xiao yu san, wu hou wei da, mm -hmm. meaning uh, there are three ways to be in, uh, to, to lack filial piety to your ancestors. And the, the major uh, uh, sign of you being not filial enough to your ancestor is not having offsprings. Mm -hmm. So uh, this cultural values are still uh, playing a very significant role in China's uh, family system and in China's uh, dominant cultural values. So we see this l lag between technology, possible technical possibilities and uh, the mores and uh, mm -hmm. uh, laws and the regulations. But briefly, uh, Anna, you know, do you think we have enough regulation and laws to protect the sur surrogate mother and surrogate children, for example? You know, in a, in a case, even in the commercial uh, use of surrogacy, for example, the mother, the surrogate mother, uh, gets basically a small percentage of the cost because there's a cost of, uh, you pay the agency, you pay the lawyer, you pay the insurance company, et cetera, uh, clinical uh, services, et cetera. Uh, so it, it, do you think it, there's enough protection for the surrogate mother, surrogate children, sometimes the children could be abandoned? Yeah, I agree. I agree with my colleague on this. There, there is not. There's been this lag in there, and unfortunately, it's only going to get worse. Uh, the technology is going to boom ahead uh, pretty soon. You can basically select your child in a test tube, and, and it can be, you know, maybe even artificially uh, done. And there will be a lot of questions about that. Uh, culture enters into it, and I would agree. Um, people have to not look at this through the culture, their own culture, but look at this as a worldwide issue and understand that there'll be different comfort levels depending on which country and which culture you're involved in. Thank you, uh, thank you Professor Lee over there. Uh, let's move on to another health issue, a different one. Uh, the Biden administration will reverse Trump's policy putting the US back in the World Health Organization and joining its COVAX vaccine scheme. Additionally, three Chinese vaccine developers have applied to join COVAX how will the new U.S. policy affect the vaccine distribution globally, and how will China-U.S. interaction or cooperation, if there is, shape the fight against the pandemic? To discuss these issues, we are joined by Professor Wu Zhiwei, Director of the Center for Public Health Research at the Medical School of Nanjing University. Uh, welcome, Professor uh, Li uh, Zhiwei over there. Uh, obviously, uh, again, Tangyang here, I'll start with you. You know, the U.S., the, we have a new uh, government in D.C., in, in Washington, and then obviously a lot of policies have been reversed on the first day of the Biden uh, administration. One of them is uh, uh, the U.S. will go back to the World Health Organization and then join this COVAX global vaccine dis uh, distribution system over there. Uh, so what's the concern and how it will help the World Health Organization? Well, the World Health Organization just released a report where they uh, were even critical of themselves. They, they made it clear that they had not uh, responded to this uh, very well. And the issue is this is a global issue. You can't say, oh, my country is safe and my people are safe. Well, you know, the fact is that the world is interconnected. Uh, global supply chains, uh, goods, services, they're all connected now. So. It has to be dealt with on a global basis, and the idea that what, and what has happened right now is that uh, the developed countries have basically run in and bought up all of the stock, leaving um, you know all the rest of the countries uh, basically uh, looking out for themselves. And this is not the way to do that. You don't want just because the country is poor, you don't want them to be a hotspot for COVID-19 and possibly a distillation. Now, what we've seen in the past uh, few weeks is that these when you allow the COVID-19 to kind of multiply, what happens is you get new strains, and these strains represent another health risk. So it's not just a question of, com you know, of 
conquering COVID-19 once and for all, you have to be very, very wary and stop it as soon as possible so you don't get these variations. Good point over there. Uh, so, uh, Zhiwei, obviously, you know, this is a global issue, not an issue of the U.S., not an issue of uh, individual country over mm -hmm. there. Um, WHO Secretary General Dr. Tedros, you know, has condemned the recently vaccine nationalism, and the, he's uh, very unhappy to see that. Uh, if you look at, at this distribution of the vaccine, uh, here is from uh, The Guardian here, you know, high-income countries uh, represent 16% of the world's population. They hold 60%, 60% of the COVID vaccines purchased so far. Canada, as a, uh, a case in point here, topped the list, having purchased enough vaccines to cover more than five times their population. Obviously, uh, it's not uh, even distribution of the vaccines. Well, actually, that, that actually is a, a serious problem. It's not only Canada, but other, a number of other industrialized countries also stock up the vaccine uh, top, uh, stockpiles as well. Uh, I think, you know, uh, that's one of the uh, key reasons why the UN forms, uh, the WHO forms a, a COVAX program, basically trying to guarantee or make sure that the poor country actually could get the uh, 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 vaccine shells in terms of, you know, uh, virus containment. Um, you know, this is one of the problems we are facing uh, in, in, in the current world, that uh, we are facing a, a, a very you know, aggressive pandemic, but uh, the industrialized countries, they have the financial capacity and the research, uh, and, the research and development capacity. So um, uh, that's actually something which we call the vaccine nationalism. I think the UN COVAX program is exactly trying to tackle that problem problem and trying to make sure that, you know, uh, the poor country actually could get the vaccine without uh, basically uh, depending on whether they are able to pay or not. Mm -hmm. Well, Zhiwei, another issue here, obviously, if you look at the vaccine so far approved by the World Health Organization, two of them, one is from Pfizer uh, BioNTech and another is from Madonna. Uh, the first one, uh, Pfizer, uh, Pfizer vaccine, the problem is like uh, you have, uh, it requires a super cold chain. And for the Madonna vaccine, it's very expensive, not exactly for the developing countries. So this has made them not ideal choice uh, for this global vaccine uh, scheme, COVAX here. AstraZeneca is yet to be approved. Chinese. Uh, the three Chinese uh, uh, vaccine developers have supplemented the material, you know, uh, applying for to supply their vaccines to the global uh, supply chain over there. Uh, what, what's the prospect of resolving the lack of vaccine, let's say? Well, uh, you see the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are the two uh, earliest uh, vaccine got approved and put into the actual use. So I think it's uh, reasonable that uh, they, they actually have uh, ramp up the productions. Uh, you can see that in the U.S., the uh, Pfizer and, uh, and Moderna vaccines actually uh, can be, um, you know, uh, distributed to other parts of the, um, the, the world. And, and there are a lot of uh, very strong, you know, production capacity. So um, it would definitely help. As you just mentioned, that the drawback of those two vaccines are they need a very strict uh, cold chain storage and transportation. And I, I actually, you know, everybody uh, in, in this... Um, uh, 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 fighting against the pandemic, they are worried that uh, in the uh, third, uh, third world, the developing world, uh, they would have a tremendous difficulty in keeping the vaccine uh, under required uh, uh, conditions and uh, do the uh, proper distribution and uh, applications. The Chinese vaccines are based on more on the kind of traditional technology, which is very well demonstrated, and we knew the the uh, safety profile and also uh, it requires a much less stringent storage and the transportation uh, uh, conditions. So I, I think, you know, this is uh, um, uh, provided very strong uh, options to uh, utilize those vaccines in developing countries. I think that would uh, go well in those countries uh, in terms of uh, uh, the vaccine applications. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Zui, uh, with the U.S., uh, you know, coming back to the World Health Organization and they agreed to join this COVAX, uh, you know, scheme over there, how much help, uh, of help, you know, uh, will be from Washington? I mean, Washington has promised to pay its dues, at least, to the World Health Organization there. Well, 
Uh, I think, you know, when Shunan comes back into the WHO, definitely is a very strong positive sign that the U.S. is coming back to the mainstream uh, world, uh, world body, and also in, in particularly in this period, is that the U.S.'s role is uh, is a very uh, not only symbolic but also would give a, um, a, a lot of help in terms of fighting this pandemic. The U.S. has the technology, has the financial uh, capacity, and also has its you know uh, very extensive uh, public health uh, networks across not only in uh, developed countries but also in developing countries as well. So they, they have the tremendous expertise uh, in this field. So I, I'm pretty sure, that, you know, the U.S. comes back into WHO would be a, a very strong um, uh, support in terms of uh, 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 c containment of the virus uh, in this uh, particular time. Mm -hmm. Well, Anna, you know, back in uh, Obama administration's time, you know, uh, China and the U.S. They worked so well together. You know, the, the scientists from the two countries worked under the same roof, in the same lab in Sierra Leone uh, to fight against the Ebola. Now we have the Biden administration, you know, uh, showing the willingness, you know, to uh, join this, you know, to practice multilateralism. Uh, probably, how likely is it for China and the U.S. can join hands again to work together to fight against this pandemic? Well, it's not a probability. It's 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 just reality. Um, you know, Co COVAX is China is also a member and will be pushing it. Uh, Chinese vaccines are, are much less expensive, uh, and as I said, uh, the logistically they're much easier to distribute. So it'll be probable that they'll play a very big role, uh, getting it accepted. But you know, I, I see this and a lot of other issues, uh, WTO, etc. These these are actually building blocks of trust. If China and the U.S. can work together to combat the global issue mm -hmm. of COVID-19, then that would change, I think, a lot of people's perception, or at least be, be the beginning. But there's so many other issues, uh, whether it's climate change, um, the peacekeeping, uh, piracy, terrorism, uh, that these uh, powers are going to have to work together if they want a better world. So I'm very hopeful that uh, in this particular case, they will. Uh, this will be the beginning of perhaps a better understanding between the two countries. Very hopeful. Uh, well, let's uh, leave there for now and take a look at this week's Newsmaker. With the uh, inauguration, you know, the U.S. always say there's a lot of celebration. Uh, now there's a Biden administration. People say the U.S. is coming back, and the U.S. is coming back to normalcy. If we say it's normalcy, so previous four years obviously is a bit abnormal or unusual. So the, the legacy of Donald Trump, how unusual it is. Well, it's very unusual, and it, it's, uh, he possibly could go down as one of the worst presidents in history, especially if he is found guilty by the Senate of, of staging an insurrection or encouraging it. Um, you know, his, a lot of his policies failed. He can blame COVID-19, he can blame China, he can blame whoever he wants, but the fact is, when you're in charge, you're responsible, and he's not taking that track. So uh, his legacy is in tatters. Um, every day that Biden looks measured, responsible, uh, you know, it, it makes him, uh, by definition, look worse. But the big issue, though, is you can't tr count out Trumplicans. Uh, these are the Republicans who follow him. He still has the largest segment, 60, 70 percent of Republicans believe that Trump is the right guy. And unless they start peeling off, uh, he's going to continue to have a very big effect uh, mm -hmm. within the nation. Well, as you mentioned, you know, Trump may be gone, but Trumpism uh, remains here. How, how big a, a problem is it for the Biden administration next four years? Well, it's, it's really uh, an issue. I mean, that's why uh, Biden, his first talk in the primary on, on the first day was about unity. Because mm -hmm. without a unified uh, country, you cannot uh, even begin to address the problems. Now, you know, when the world looks at the United States and they realize that 44,000 votes in three key states 
would have resulted in Donald Trump continuing to be president. Um, you know, they have doubts. You're seeing the uh, European Union go their own way, uh, you know, economically uh, in terms of signing a trade deal, um, and uh, also in terms of strengthening their own currency to get away from the hegemony of the U.S. dollar. So he has a tremendous amount of, of challenges, and people are worried that another Trump, uh, perhaps a Pompeo, uh, would be trying to jump on the stage in 2024. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, impeachment uh, trial is to start uh, early next month. You know, uh, should the impeachment proceed, or should it somehow the Congress drop the impeachment against uh, against the Trump? You know, people have different arguments. In your opinion, uh, my opinion, and it's, it's it would be better for uh, Joe Biden in terms of unity to uh, go out there and express that this man has left the office. Uh, there's no point spending time. Uh, history will make the final judgment about his actions. And quite frankly, um, not giving him a pardon, but I don't think that the, there are so many pressing problems that the United States has right now. They don't have time to be sidelined by a circus show over whether Donald Trump should be uh, thrown out. And it's quite probable that he will be facing uh, state and city charges uh, that are very serious and could take down um, Mr. Trump and his entire family, if they attack his organization, there's something called the Racketeering Act. And if they did it, if all it requires is that an organization commits two crimes within a 10 year period, and if that is ruled an organization, a corrupt organization, um, they, all the people involved, uh, are subject to uh, very, very serious penalties. This was used against the mob. So uh, if that is used against him, he is in deep trouble. Do you think his people, his supporters, uh, somehow, you know, when they see this riot with more and more revelation of what really happened, you know, more and more facts, uh, along with the investigation, do, do you think people will have a change of heart somehow and come back to unity, if not unity, at least closer uh, to the Biden administration there? Well, you, you saw a 15 to 20 percent drop in uh, his his polling mm. uh, immediately. We still have yet to see uh, new polling on it and see exactly where he is. Um, but uh, my guess is that as Biden, if he continues on this on the you know direction that he's going now, being safe, assuring, uh, you know, looking like he's working, that he's he's checked in and he cares about the American people and stays in the center in terms of his policies, mm. I think. Uh, Donald Trump's support will start to wither. So Trump says he will come back in one way or another. How likely is it, very well, briefly? Yeah, politically not. He might come back in an orange jumpsuit, one-piece jumpsuit on his way to jail. Thank you. Uh, over there. With that, we are coming to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also watch us on the CGTN app or on YouTube. I'm Xu Qianduo. You can find me on Twitter, Xu Qianduo in one word. Thanks for watching. See you next week.